Welcome to Millennial 717. I'm Andrew. I'm Laura. And I'm Pamela. On today's episode, we'll discuss how Biden stacks up against Trump in the lie department, a new court case that could change how we use apps, the movie that recently became the all-time best-rated film, and an update on Lady Gaga's dogs. It's been a big week for me. Last weekend, I did something I haven't done in over a year, and this weekend, I'm doing something I haven't done in over a year. This past weekend, I did this thing where you go into a big room, and it's dark, and there's a big screen, and everybody watches the same thing, and you can't pause it. Whoa. Oh, my goodness. We saw a movie at a theater, I believe they're called. (laughs) Wow. Now, there's like nothing in movie theaters right now. There are some Oscar nominated movies, and we decided not to see those. We wanted to see something that we really hadn't heard of before, and that was Nobody, starring Bob Odenkirk from Breaking Bad. And it was a really good action thriller, pretty dark, really great fight sequences, and a little funny too. Did y'all buy snacks and stuff, or you just like went in? Okay. Now, here's the thing, and I'll warn people now. A lot of people weren't wearing masks in the theater, even though it was supposedly required. And during the pre-roll, it was like, you know, you must wear a mask while watching the movie. We're glad to have you back, blah, 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 blah. But yeah, a lot of people didn't follow that rule. We did, of course, because we're role models for society. But a lot of people weren't. And they didn't even, like, announce it. It just came up on a, a card on the screen. And I was like, maybe that's something that should also be announced in the theater as well, because a lot of people are looking at their phones. Or if it's announced, you might feel a little guilty about not wearing your mask. Yeah. I do find it a little annoying, though, that they aren't doing a better job, or at least in your area, they weren't doing a better job of enforcing it. Because I've legitimately seen movie theaters come in and make people throw away their snacks that they got from somewhere else. What? You know, I've seen that happen, especially if the theater wasn't super crowded and it was easy to pinpoint people. So it's like, man, if you can do that, you can throw people out for what for not wearing masks. Yeah, I was disappointed there wasn't some more enforcement there. And it's a comfort thing, too. I mean, like, maybe I don't want to go back now because I know they're not really enforcing mask wearing. They just need like one of those, you know, like when you go to early screenings and they have those people that come in with like the the nighttime binoculars to check on the crowd and make sure they just need somebody to do that. Yeah. Yeah. To make sure nobody's filming and everybody's wearing their mask. And everyone's wearing their masks. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Some theaters probably will be smart and do that and good for them, but not this particular theater that I went to. So anyway, the thing I'm doing this weekend for the first time in over a year, my mom is coming out to visit over Mother's Day weekend. Yeah. And I haven't seen a family member in over a year. So that's pretty crazy. Like a lot has changed in my life since the pandemic started. And uh, she's very excited as our Pat and I. So that'll be good. And she's been fully vaxxed for well over a month. I crossed my two weeks after my second vaccination just this past Thursday. So yeah, a lot new happening here. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. I actually am hitting my two weeks since dose number two of Moderna today as of the day of this recording. Um, So that feels really good. We also have some friends coming into town this coming weekend. They've also been fully vaxxed. So we're getting together, and I'm so excited. You're going to shake their hands? I'm going to hug people. I don't, I'm not going <laughs> to shake their hands. <laughs> but you were I'm just definitely... hoping to get rid of handshakes. That's why I say that. Yeah. I mean, handshaking is kind of gross, honestly. Um, but yeah, really looking forward to that and just the overall increased sense of comfort that comes from being vaccinated. Of course, we've talked about on the show before that it doesn't mean that you're free to like go back to living your best life and like, you know, (laughs) spitting on people or making out with random people like you still shouldn't do that. Right. (laughs) But uh, you should never spit on people. That's just rude. Unless they ask for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, but generally speaking, there still are a good number of COVID safety guidelines that we should all be following, even if we're fully vaccinated. Um, but still, knowing that I can actually give my other vaccinated friends a hug feels pretty good. 
We also got a confessional um, with an unpopular vaccine opinion that I wanted to share because I thought it raised a really good point. They wrote, Hi, Millennial. I have an uncomfortable and unpopular confessional related to vaccines. My husband and I have been trying to get pregnant for over five years now. It gets more heartbreaking every month. I had to have an ovary and a fallopian tube removed because a cyst was overtaking them. The doctor also found endometriosis in my stomach, which means two more strikes against us. We would have no problem getting the vaccine if we already had children, but that is not the case. My OBGYN, who is fully vaccinated, told me specifically to hold off. There isn't a lot of research yet on the vaccine's side effects with pregnancy or people in their childbearing years. When people ask, we feel like we have to explain our reasoning or else we'll be pinned as racist, alt-right, Trump-supporting conspiracy theorists, which we are not. (laughs) Yeah, it sounds like you have very good reasons to be holding off. Yeah, and I definitely understand if your physician has given you a recommendation, you should 100% listen to them. And it sounds like that's the case here. I think there are certainly valid reasons for not getting vaccinated at this point. Mm -hmm. But in order to determine what those are, everyone should be having a conversation with their doctor. Um, I do think that it sucks that you're in a situation where you feel like you either have to expose something deeply personal that you may not want to talk about or run the risk of being stereotyped as, you know, a QAnon supporter. Um, I don't know. I feel like if I were in this situation, I would be compelled to be like, I don't really want to talk about it. I'm not a Trump supporter, but I have reasons that I've discussed with my doctor and that's as far as I want to go with this. But I feel like that's like the maximum that you should have to say to anybody. And generally speaking, you don't owe anyone an answer. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's just tough because there is a lot of rhetoric from vaccine supporters that sort of paints with a broad brush. Mm -hmm. And while they don't make up the majority of cases of people not getting vaccinated, there are certainly very valid reasons not to do so. Again, that's a decision for you to make with your doctor. So Mother's Day is coming up and I was trying to figure out what to do for my mom. And she has this little like back patio that has never been used since she bought the house. And I thought it would be cute to like fix it up, buy some like patio furniture to go back there. And so I found all of this wrought iron patio furniture at a secondhand store that was like a little bit worse for wear. So I spent the weekend while she was away um, trying to spruce that up and like spray paint it and all that stuff. And this is just like your warning to not do this in store uh, indoors if you can, because I Ooh, thought I had yeah. enough ventilation, but I almost passed out in my garage. I almost passed out. Oh, my God. Yeah, because, you know, it's like it's a lot of I think I went through. I'm not even done yet. I went through like three cans of, of spray paint and like the pieces that I was able to get done look really good. But it was just like. Like not enough to have just the side door open and not the full garage, but it was too windy. So I thought, mm, if I have the door open, it'll be fine. And it was not fine. So <laughs> that's my story of how I almost died <laughs> this weekend. <laughs> story how of Pam how I almost died. Almost died for Mother's Day. I did. <laughs> <laughs> that's love. That's a good that daughter is. right there. I sacrificed myself for you, Mom. You're welcome. Yeah. I was looking for a very specific color and um, I went to like three different stores to try and find this this specific shade of blue in a spray paint bottle formula. And I learned that a bunch of the companies that make these spray paints are actually on back order for the cans because of the pandemic. So it's just really interesting to see like what small subsectors of, you know, companies are still being affected. Um based on like what happened last year and stuff like that. So Mm -hmm. Laura, are you doing anything for your mom on Mother's Day? Yeah, of course. We're um, (sighs) Mama T is very content to be around family, 
have people cook some good eats and drink some good drinks. It will also be the first time that we'll be we'll all be able to hug my brother in over a year. So I know that that's going to be really meaningful for her. Um, but yeah, yeah, we'll probably ask what she would like us to prepare and what signature cocktail she would like us to make for the <laughs> yeah, occasion. That's the real question. <laughs> yeah. Does she have a favorite gonna... <laughs> cocktail? Oh, it kind of um depends on the season. She is really into G and T's, but she also likes margaritas. Um she also just likes whiskey. <laughs> Just whiskey. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, she's pretty flexible, but we'll definitely ask what her preference is for the coming week. Do you think your mom will cry seeing your brother? Well, we've seen him over the course of the last year. We just we've had to not hug him. Right. Got Um, it. Right. So. But, yeah, I I think it could be a little bit emotional for the parentals. Yeah, for sure. My mom's going to I think my mom's going to cry when when she sees me for the first time. Yeah, well, you haven't gotten to see your mom. Right, exactly. She always cries when because I've been living away from home since 2008 now. She always cries, always, always, always when I leave. Like if I go home after visiting home or even if she goes home after visiting me. By the way, should be noted, my dad is not coming to visit me because it's more important for him to continue being afraid of flying rather than, you know, being a good father and and seeing his son. So, you know, priorities. That's still going on. Yeah. (laughs) That's still going on and will will never end. Uh... More to get to today. But first, it's time for a word from this week's sponsor, Stamps.com. Are you still going to the post office? Are you still paying full price for postage? Well, thanks to Stamps.com, you don't have to anymore. Free up more time in your busy day by doing your mailing and shipping anytime, anywhere, right from your computer. Send letters, ship packages, and pay a lot less with discounted rates from USPS, UPS, and more. I love using Stamps.com because they make it as simple as possible to mail a package by collecting some basic info about what you're sending, and then they give you a label to print. Then you can drop it off at a post office, have a carrier pick it up, or drop it off anywhere that accepts drop-offs. That's what I do. I have a local mailing place with a drop-off area right at the front. I take two steps inside, drop off the package, and I'm out. Boom. Done in two seconds. One of the best parts is Stamps.com will automatically email the recipient a tracking number so you don't have to deal with carefully typing in that long number, making sure you got it right, and then sending it to someone. Whether you're a small office sending invoices, a side hustle Etsy shop shipping out orders, or just navigating this hybrid work life, Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. No wonder over 1 million businesses choose Stamps.com for their mailing and shipping. Stop wasting time going to the post office and go to Stamps.com instead. There's no risk, and with our promo code MILL, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in M-I-L-L. That's Stamps.com, promo code M-I-L-L. Stamps.com, never go to the post office again. So I thought since we have now passed 100 days since Biden took office, we could have a quick round of the number. And I wanted you two to guess Biden's number of misleading claims in his first 100 days versus Trump's number of misleading claims claims in his first 100 days. First of all, in the interest of full disclosure, pretty sure that I can ballpark Trump's. Should I go after Pam? You can, but this is in his first 100 days. You can still ballpark that? I I think so. Damn. I'm pretty sure I remember reading about this. Ooh. Okay. So I'm trying to be honest here. <laughs> Test um, your memory. I, I yeah. can't remember anything. Um, What is time? So I'm going to guess that, and this might even be lowballing it, I, I'm sure that Trump misled the public at least twice a day in his first 100 days. So I'll say 200. <laughs> Well-reasoned. Well-reasoned. Yeah. Pam, what do you think? How many times is Biden misled? I don't know. I'll say like 30. 30? Yeah. Um, okay, for Trump, I'm going to say 550. Ooh. And for Biden, I'll say 150. Okay, so Laura, good memory. Trump misled 511 times in his first oh, 100 damn. days. Wow. So five a day. I did like your reasoning, though, Pam. I know. You know on a, like a daily basis, <laughs> times 100. And then Biden misled 78 times over oh, 100 so days. I was like double on that. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's person, good. do you think he is? Well, it's good to have my expectations lower so that yeah. when I get when I get the news that it's actually not that bad, I'm not as disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to point this out because obviously we were very critical of Trump all four Mm -hmm. years. And I think we should try to be more critical of Biden on the show. We haven't really been yet. And we can talk about that in a moment. Um, But two of Biden's biggest misleading claims, he claimed that Georgia's new voting laws had shortened voting hours, which was not true. And he also has been saying that federal contracts awarded directly to foreign companies rose by 30 percent under Trump. And that's not true either. So worth mentioning. I don't know if he's purposely lying in the, in these situations. If I were to guess, I think he might just have some bad information that he keeps repeating. This is something we saw with Trump as well. He gets these thoughts in his head and he just blurts them out. During the course of Trump's term, I definitely started paying more attention to the news. And I'm trying to continue that into the Biden administration because I wasn't paying as much attention During Obama's term, I want to know when Biden's misleading, too. I don't think we should pretend like everything's perfect right now. And speaking of Biden not being so great right now, he hasn't been so great on immigration. One of the things that he hasn't been great on is raising the refugee cap. He had said that he would on the campaign trail, and then he didn't. Well, he just said on Monday uh, that he is going to raise the refugee cap from 15,000 people to 62,500. So that's good. He was under a lot of pressure to raise that cap. And now it was well, it was in his campaign promises that that was like a day one act that he was going to take. So I'm absolutely glad that he's had mounting pressure on him about this. John Oliver actually did a really good piece about this uh, at least last week ago or the week before that. I don't know if you all saw it, but the upshot is that there were people who have gone through the application process been approved and are just waiting for this ban to be lifted so they can get on a plane and come to the United States. Some of these people had already purchased plane tickets Mm. in advance thinking they'd be able to come because of Biden's campaign promise. And then the date of their flight came and went and they weren't able to come here. There are also people whose, um, sort of deadlines have expired in terms of their health and security checks. So some of these people, if they're not allowed to come to the U.S. within the period of time that they were promised, will have to go through the whole process of applying and qualifying again. This is a deeply significant problem. Yeah. And I do not understand Biden's reasoning here, to be honest with you. I don't think any reasoning has been provided. If I were to guess, I would assume it's because more people were trying to come over the southern border and maybe that scared Biden off from wanting to raise the cap because if he raised it, even more people would try to come over the border. That's what I'm assuming. So many people who were waiting weren't even people coming from Latin America. It was people from around the globe who were impacted by this. So Mm -hmm. I just I don't understand. I don't understand if it's a border concern or if it's a coronavirus concern. Um, But there are certainly more humane ways that we can approach dealing with those concerns than just Mm -hmm. leaving the cap as it was and not providing any justification for doing so. Yeah, they need to explain what's been going on. For they sure. really do. But I, I think Biden was afraid of being seen as too loose on immigrants. So that's why he didn't raise it as quickly. But I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I will say, I think that when it comes to Georgia's new voting laws, I would argue that what has come out of the Biden White House on this topic has been more akin to stretching the truth rather than outright lying, there are certain things where certain voting hours have been restricted, specifically with regards to special elections. Um, Special elections have now been limited to a single Monday through Friday period. Um, Whereas before, you guys remember when we talked about our special election in January, people were allowed to start voting as early as December, right? So that does cut down on the amount of time that people would have access to voting. Um, 
this is also one of those scenarios where we don't know 100% yet how this is going to play out, but I have read analysis and opinion that some believe, progressive proponents believe, that the changes in the amount of uh, early voting locations that are available, in the amount of drop boxes that are available, plus the time periods that they're available, that the end result for city dwelling voters will ultimately be reduced a reduced number of hours that come as a result of lack of availability, whereas rural people are expected to see an increase in their ability or in their uh, allotted amount of voting hours. So I think it's this is a little bit more nuanced than like it's a lie versus it's not. I think that there are enough things that we can criticize about Georgia's voting most recent voting law that have nothing to do with the number of voting hours available to people. So I would agree that this probably is not the Biden administration's best bet when it comes to trying to hammer this point home to people that the GOP across the country is trying to restrict the restrict access to the right to vote. Um, there are definitely other things that they can harp on that aren't this talking point because mm-hmm. this talking point doesn't fully capture what Democrats are trying to get across to voters. So anyway, here's my campaign pledge. We will try to be more critical of Biden on the show when he deserves it, because we really haven't been so far. Well, and... he's also been in office for 100 days. So, oh, But again, but we haven't brought up the immigrant issue, for example. Yeah. And that's been, you know, a very big issue. And And I'll admit that I have slacked on checking hard news as often often as I was when Trump was in office <laughs> because it's it's easy to just get lured into a false sense of security after having been been yeah. on edge for, you know, four years. Yeah. So And after the past four years, we deserve a break if you want to take a break yeah. from keeping a close eye on the news. Now is probably a good time to do it. So I don't blame you for that. But Yeah. I think it's natural and I think There has been a lot of good that has come out of these first hundred days. And because of the just mental fatigue that we've experienced over the last four years, I think that it's natural for people to want to absorb the good news and maybe not pay as much attention to um, areas where the current president rightly deserves to be critiqued. But I think you're right, Andrew, that moving forward, it's possible to celebrate the wins but also yeah highlight the areas where there's room for improvement because we're we're a pretty progressive bunch here and Joe Biden is not the most progressive democrat out there so yeah. i think there's plenty of room for criticism there absolutely and this is what we do on mugglecast yeah. we talk about something we love but we also criticize because we care right. and not everything is always going to be perfect so let's treat him like we do jk rowling and Harry i know <laughs> well i mean one area where biden uh is beating jk rowling is that during <laughs> during his speech last week he literally said to trans youth i've got your back yeah that, that was, was really nice, nice. yes it's so important to have somebody holding the highest office in the land say something like that, especially given the number of anti-trans bills that have been floating around in the country. It's good for kids to hear. It's probably good for parents to hear, too, yeah. knowing that the president has the back of maybe their own child. Well, quick note with relation to um, access to voting in this country. Florida is the latest state that has uh, passed some restrictive voting laws of its own. Um, Quick summary, it limits the use of drop boxes, implements stricter voter ID requirements, eliminates automatic absentee ballot registration, and also gives partisan observers more access to the ballot counting process, which sounds pretty familiar given some of the stories we've talked about in the last couple of months. It's just another reminder that the GOP, while unable to prove that there was any widespread fraud in the 2020 election, are still trying to change the rules to make future elections more advantageous to them because they can't 
win unless they're cheating. Mm -hmm. So we really just wanted to put this out there. If you live in Florida, please, please, please reach out to your elected representatives. Um, We'll also include a link in the show notes to a bit more information about this. We've definitely talked about the impacts of, you know, what it does to people when you limit access to drop boxes, when you change the requirements for requesting absentee ballots. Um, there are even some concerns with the case with regard to Florida that changing the rules around requesting absentee ballots will be particularly confusing for seniors who overwhelmingly tend to be Republicans. So this is a bipartisan issue. It's not good for anyone when these types of laws are implemented. So I would highly encourage reading more up on this and also reaching out to your representatives to say, no bueno. Most read political story on the Washington Post today hits on Laura's point. Florida Republicans rushed to curb mail voting after Trump's attacks on the practice. Now some fear could lower GOP turnout. Yep. Let's hope it does. And then they undo things. I mean, I don't know how else to to fix this at this point. They have to realize that this hurts Republicans, too. Agreed. Well, what's going on with uh, Apple right now? So Apple is in a heated battle with uh, Fortnite or more specifically Fortnite's parent company, Epic Games. Uh, today was their first court hearing. And basically what it comes down to is that Epic Games is taking Apple to court to argue that Apple is running a monopoly on its app store by forcing all app developers to use Apple's store to distribute software and also to use Apple's payment processing system. So um, this doesn't really seem like it might be that big of a deal, but it could potentially uh, make for some really drastic changes in terms of the way that all iPhone users, um, you know, download different programs to their devices. So it is just kind of something to to keep in the back of your mind that it is going on and it could possibly have um, some effect on the way that you use your phones. Uh, so the tension between both companies kind of started running high uh, in August of last year when Fortnite introduced a feature into its own phone app that allowed players to bypass Apple's app store completely. Um, so for those of you that don't know, Fortnite is free to play but the way that Epic Games makes money is by uh, people who uh, choose to purchase like in-game uh, dance effects or like new garb for their players and things like that. Um, so as part of Apple's terms of service, technically all in-app purchases have to go through their app store and their payment processing service. Uh, but Epic Games was like, no, you guys can just buy it straight through us. And the reason they probably did this is because Apple currently takes a 30% cut of revenue from purchases made using its in-app purchase, which is the only way you're supposed to be able to pay for stuff. Um, they recently lowered that cut to 15% for any company that grosses under $1 million in revenue. But that's still quite a bit of money. So, you yeah. know, a lot of these bigger companies, even though they are making money, it's a big cut to take. And then since it is such a big cut to take, some of these apps will actually charge more in app to subscribe to make up that 30% that they're losing to Apple. Or you can subscribe outside of the app. Let's say Netflix, I believe might be one of these companies who does this. I'm not sure. But some some do. You can subscribe on their site for cheaper than you can in the app. And that's because of this ridiculous 30% cut that Apple is taking. And just last week, Apple announced you'll be able to pay for additional content from podcasts and say, you know, we we can set something up in Apple Podcasts and charge you five bucks a month. Apple will take 30% from podcasters as well. We're not Fortnite. We're not Netflix. We can't lose 30% to Apple. And it's like, why does Apple need 30%? from podcasters or from a Fortnite. It's a ridiculous amount of money. So Apple is going to take 30% from podcasters and then 15% after the first year. So they are going to go down a little bit. But why 30% in that first year to to begin with? Now this is like personal to us. We weren't app developers, but we are podcasters. And we wouldn't want to do this because we have our Patreon anyway. But 30%? Whoa. That's a lot of money. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. And I'm glad that you brought that up as well, because that is one of the ways that um, we could see a change if Epic wins this court battle. 
oops, my mic sock just fell off. Uh, so one of the things that we could see that might change if they win is that you'll finally be able to download apps or buy apps from sources other than Apple's App Store. So it's possible that in the future, you could be downloading like different apps for different app stores and then buying things through them. It could also potentially mean that there's a little bit more competition. So you could find um, a cheaper source to download whatever app you're interested in purchasing. And it could also lower the price of in-app purchases as well if Apple isn't the only place that you can, you know, buy those from. So yeah. it's possible that this could have an effect on this, co- on the consumer as well as on these companies, you know, that are yeah. app developers and stuff like that. This is going to have big ramifications for the industry and consumers. I'm not so sure that Epic is going to win this. I have a feeling Apple will be able to win this because they're Apple. They have a lot of money and a lot of talent, a lot of talented lawyers and they'll probably be able to squeak by. But this won't be the end of this. This will oh, come back to haunt not. them again. No, I will say the one thing that occurs to me, I love the idea that there could potentially be more competition here. I think that's better for us as consumers. But what kind of uh, is a sticking point for me is that at least when you're downloading something from the Apple App Store, you know that it had to pass some sort of rigorous testing process in order to qualify to be there. So you can feel safe downloading applications from there. I don't know how I feel about downloading applications from other providers that maybe are not as rigorous about their requirements. And that is actually something that Apple is arguing that they, they have this system in place because it's secure for the consumer and also for iPhone users. Um, but, and so you're definitely going to, if you're following this course ca- court case over the course of the next three weeks, see Epic Games trying to prove that wrong. And the other thing is, what is Apple providing that makes that 30% cut justifiable? Not much. They're hosting the app. Yeah, that, that costs a little bit of money. They might promote your app. But you're paying 30% to Apple, whether or not they're promoting your app. And then think about podcasters as well. They will host the audio content. This is actually the first time they're ever doing this, hosting audio content on their own servers. But they're not doing any work to earn that 30%, in my opinion. It's really nothing. So it's it's just very frustrating to see. And I feel terrible for app developers. They put together a business, and then they have to give 30% of it to Apple. It's disgusting. Yeah, I didn't realize it was that high. And when you think about, you know, the vast majority of, you know, indie creators and new podcasts, I mean, how much income are these generating at all? Right. And you think about Apple taking 30% of that. It's pretty, pretty steep. And by the way, a couple of people in the Discord are asking how much does Patreon take? They currently take 8% for new creators at their mid-level tier. That's their main tier. Uh, we were grandfathered in at five, but these percentages do not count the credit card processing fees. So um, still a lot less, even if you're in at that 8%, still less than Apple's 30% and then after a year, 15%. Yeah. And again, it's like, you know, I think, Laura, you may have just said this. We've got bills to pay. Like, we can't give up 30% of revenue So just because Apple's hosting it. So, hey, let's pay some of our bills right now. And uh, I'd like to see Apple take 30% of this. Try touching this, Apple. <laughs> <laughs> we have a new sponsor on the show who we've all gotten to use over the past couple of weeks, Felix Gray. They are makers of the best blue light glasses out there. I'm wearing mine right now. I believe Laura is as well. Yep. So staring at screens all day can cause a lot of problems. Headaches, difficulty concentrating, poor sleep, tired or burning eyes. If all your screen time is to blame for these issues, that's because of the blue light that your screen is emitting. One popular solution are blue light filtering glasses, but you need to buy the best ones so you can truly solve the problem. And that's where Felix Gray comes in. Felix Gray lenses filter 15 times more of that blue light that can make screen time tough on eyes and disruptive to sleep. Again, 15 times more than other products. That's a huge difference. I like mine a lot. First of all, I just really like the style. 
of it. They have so many different um, cute styles you can order from, and there are also different colors available. So there's really something for everyone when it comes to the aesthetics behind it. But I've actually been wearing these for the last week and a half um, since I got them while I've been working. And they do make a really big difference in the amount of eye strain I'm feeling from staring at a screen all day. And could be anecdotal, but I feel like I'm falling asleep easier at night. I don't know if anybody Good. else has had the same experience. It's funny you mentioned nighttime because I've also been, you know, sometimes you want to stream something for, before bed. I don't know about you guys. I don't have a TV in my room. So if I want to do that, then I have to use my computer. And so I've been using them uh, for that as well. And I feel like it's been helping for sure. I'm on a screen all day long. So it's just really nice to know that um, there's just like a little extra bit of protection happening on that front. So I started wearing these. And then my first day, I was I wore them for one or two hours. Then I took them off and I'm looking at my screen and I'm like, oh, oh my God. I never realized how much eye strain I had until I started wearing these. So now I'm kind of addicted to these glasses because they really do work. The lenses start at $95 and come in high quality finishes. I have the Voltas in black. I love glasses, by the way. So I'm glad I can finally wear glasses, <laughs> have a good reason to wear glasses. They also have prescription lenses starting at $145. This is an ongoing issue for people, and it's important that you do something about it. We can't reduce our screen time when working, but we can make it easier on the eyes. Get yourself a pair of glasses made for the 21st century and designed for modern, hardworking eyes. Go to felixgrayglasses.com slash M-I-L-L for the best blue light glasses on the market. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash M-I-L-L. Free shipping, free returns, free exchanges. felixgrayglasses.com slash M-I-L-L. So I wanted to talk about Clubhouse again. Pam informed us about Clubhouse probably two months ago now or so. And since then, there's been a couple of big developments. First of all, Facebook is now getting in on the Clubhouse game. And this comes after Twitter and Discord launched Clubhouse competitors of their own. Remember, Clubhouse is where you can host live audio chats and easily bring panelists on and off a virtual stage. None of the audio is recorded, so you have to be there to experience the moment. You can't listen to it later. So it's very different than a podcast. It's kind of like going to a conference because you got to be there to experience it in most cases. So I thought we could talk about this again because it has grown in popularity since the last time that we spoke about it. Are you two using Clubhouse at all? Nope. Not regularly, no. (laughs) I have to say, I do check in on the Clubhouse app because sometimes when I don't have a new podcast to listen to, I can just load up Clubhouse and I can see what people are talking about. And then I pop in, I listen. A lot of these aren't particularly great, at least the ones that I've been in. But it's nice to know I have something to listen to if I want to. Now, I thought we could get meta today. Like I said, Discord now has their own Clubhouse competitor, and we are hosting a Clubhouse within our Discord right now for our patrons. And patrons, please feel free to raise your hand in our Clubhouse. This, By the way, Discord does not call it Clubhouse. I'm just calling it that because it'll be easier to follow everything. Please raise your hand if you have something to say about Clubhouse. But you know what bums me out, Laura and Pam? All the social media networks are just like each other now. They all have stories. Yeah. They all have clubhouses. They all have filters for your photos. Like they just all copy each other. Nothing is original anymore. I think they all miss the plagiarism talk in school. <laughs> you know? Don't steal. <laughs> Don't steal. Even like Instagram, they ripped off TikTok. And now you have reels in yep. Instagram too. It's like, what's the point of any of this if they're all just copying each other? And it's all the same content across the board, right? Like mo- like Reels has taken off clearly. But more often than not, all the Reels that I see on my Explore page are just like re-uploads of people's TikToks. So same. Yeah, it's not records. really, yeah, it's not really like creating anything new. Right. I guess these social media apps are trying to reach people where they are by giving them all in one features, but it does get kind of exhausting 
when you're on one app and you see somebody's updates on Facebook, for example, and then you see the exact same stuff when you go to Instagram and Twitter. Yeah, every time I post a, an Instagram story, which is not often right now, Instagram wants so badly for me to push it over to Facebook. It's like Instagram, no, yeah. I know that you're owned yeah. by the same company, no, but like I, don't want to. I put this on Instagram because I want it to live here. I don't want anybody that I'm friends with on Facebook to see it. So stop. <laughs> what does Discord call their clubhouse feature? I don't even know what this is called. <laughs> <laughs> A stage, I guess. I don't know. Okay. Stages. Stages. Sure. <laughs> well, I guess nobody wants to say anything and that's fine. Nobody came to our clubhouse. <laughs> People came, they just didn't want to okay. participate. Okay, wait, here we go. <laughs> yeah. my, my enemy, Jen, wants to say something. <laughs> I invited you to speak, Jen. Hey, Jen. <laughs> Hello, Andrew. We finally meet. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is perfect. I love it. Oh, All right, so so Jen, uh, a couple months ago, had said <laughs> that I was being, somebody was impersonating me on Bumble, and then, like, not all the details were out there at the beginning and then more info came out and we realized that nobody was actually impersonating me. It may have been one of my friends. It It's a whole thing. Anyway, I'm just kidding, Jen. Do you use Clubhouse or Discord stages or Twitter spaces? Any of these? I do use Clubhouse. I've gotten addicted. I'm on there almost really? every day. Yes. Um, just because I'm also Ooh. an actor. So there are a lot of acting rooms on clubhouse where like casting directors will pop in agents will pop in so it's become a really good networking tool for me i have heard a lot of good things about the networking aspect of clubhouse i know somebody else who's addicted to clubhouse and has met a lot of people and had a lot of those people on his own podcast after becoming friends with them on pod on uh on clubhouse so that's interesting okay do you see clubhouse being this big for a while, do you think they might lose out to Twitter or one of these other competitors? I don't think they'll lose out to like new competitors, but I am kind of concerned for what will happen once like our, you know, post pandemic world kicks in. Just because like, I feel like one of the appeals of Clubhouse is that we can't really go out and see our friends right now, or at least like, you know, not everyone's vaccinated. So this is a great way for people to network and meet new friends and that kind of thing. So yeah. I think it makes it hard once. It's perfect for the pandemic. Yeah, exactly. Great. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that with us. I like the idea of doing this, though, um, just for, like, the future, if we're having a conversation. Right. And we see that somebody's, like, really popping off in the Discord and they have something to say. Yeah. We have a chance to give them a place to do that without needing to, like, send a Zoom link. Right. And go through all of the you know, steps that we would typically have to do. So yeah. I, I love it for this show. I don't know that I'll use it for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I'll continue using Clubhouse. I'm interested. I'm intrigued. I am worried that Facebook or Twitter or maybe even Discord will steal Clubhouse's thunder. Kind of like how, remember, Snapchat, they created stories. And then Facebook said, we'll buy you Snapchat. We'll buy you for over a billion dollars. And Snapchat said, nah. We'll, we'll go at it ourselves. Well, then what does Facebook do? They go and add stories to Instagram. And now Instagram is crushing Snapchat. But um, OK, well, Jen, thanks again. And here's what we're going to do. We'll keep the stage open for the remainder of the episode. If you, Jen, or anyone else here wants to chime in, just raise your hand about anything else we're going to say today. And we'll have you on. I love it. Sounds fun. <laughs> Great. Jen, thank you for being a guinea pig for Millennial Stages. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you for bringing me up. And I've been listening to y'all since the Smart Mouth days. So this is kind of helping Aww. me accomplish a lifelong dream. Oh, man. <laughs> thank you. See, we You're an OG. And we didn't even plan this. It was meant to go. be. <laughs> I don't know how to kick you off stage. So, you know what? Just stay on stage, Jen. Yeah, she's on mute right now. Just unmute yourself and talk whenever you want. What do we care? <laughs> <laughs> You're a panelist now. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Jen starts like completely oh. derailing the show, <laughs> yelling, Baba Booey, Baba Booey, Howard Stern's penis. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> oh, man. Well, Jen's an actress, so maybe she'll have something to say about this next story. <laughs> Uh, did you guys know that Paddington 2 is now officially the best movie of all time? I didn't. Well, now you do. <laughs> Enlighten me. <laughs> Specifically, it's the best reviewed movie of all time, according to Rotten Tomatoes, which, of course, aggregates uh, critic, 
uh, scores and also they have a separate um, scoring system for like audience scores. Um, so up until recently, it was Orson Welles 1941 classic Citizen Kane. And that movie was sitting pretty with a 100% rating on Rotten Tomatoes across 116 reviews, uh, which doesn't really seem like it would be hard to do because there are a lot of movies with uh, 100% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, but Citizen Kane had actually been up there for quite a while. The first Citizen Kane reviews were actually added to Rotten Tomatoes um, back in 2000. So it's been sitting at the top of that best movies of all time list for the last 20 years. And the whole reason that it got knocked down to 99% is because an 80 year old negative review from the Chicago Tribune was unearthed and added to the Rotten Tomatoes database. And that is when Paddington 2 swooped in <laughs> and claimed the number one spot, which is just like, this is my favorite news story from the past week, you guys. Oh my God. It's amazing. Um, so <laughs> Paddington 2 uh, is the review with the 100% rating that has been reviewed the most. It has 244 reviews total up on Rotten Tomatoes and of with like all of those reviews that it's its average score is 100%. So that's pretty cool. Um, other films that have a 100% rating and at least 40 reviews on that site include The Terminator, Toy Story, Before Sunrise, Man on a Wire, and Frankenstein, just to name a few. Um, so now you know. That's and so I wanted to know, first of all, if like film critic reviews dictate what movies you'll see or won't see, or if you trust certain reviews more than other reviews i usually go with rotten tomatoes or metacritic if there's a high overall rating i'll be interested in seeing it i honestly will not see a movie if the overall scores are pretty low i don't really pay too much attention to anything like rotten tomatoes before i go see a movie if i'm interested in seeing a movie i just go see it but how are you interested in the first place the trailer? Yeah, a trailer or if I've seen like a synopsis of it somewhere or word of mouth. If somebody's told somebody who I trust, um, somebody whose taste I have, you know, similarities with recommends something to me, I'll usually go see it then. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also just not a big um, opening weekend kind of girl either. Like I'll do that for big stuff like the MCU or like Wizarding World type things, of course. But Generally speaking, if something is on its opening weekend, I'm not going to see it until it's been in theaters for at least three weeks because I don't like going to the movies when there's a crowd. So I just don't, I don't know. I just kind of like go with the flow on what movies I want to see. And I don't, that's fair. I don't let um, reviews tell me what I will or won't see because sometimes these can be artificial too, right? There have been cases where, movies got really really high or really really low ratings on rotten tomatoes before they even came out and i feel like that's just but that's not by critics that's by people were able to thwart rotten tomato system to screw up the ratings before the movies were even out and that that is bullshit right yeah i agree with that but i feel like that kind of thing just makes me not take Rotten Tomatoes super seriously. I will read it sometimes. Like if I've seen a movie and I have a really strong impression of it, then I might go up to see what people are saying about it to see if I'm in agreement with the majority or not. Yeah, I'm kind of like Laura. I'll take a peek because I just think it's interesting, but it won't dictate what I will and won't see more often than not. If it's like a a big movie, my, my brother and I are like notorious for going to see bad movies in the movie theater. Like we just, you know, Sometimes you just yeah. want to see a train wreck uh, just for there's fun. Something, there's something fun about seeing a bad movie. Exactly. And we'll look sometimes on, you know, when he's home or we're in the same geographic location, we'll look online and be like, ooh, it's got like 40% splatometer on Rotten Tomatoes. Let's go see it anyway. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because you know it's going to be funny either way because it's either going to be so bad or so bad it's good. Um, so it does not really make very much of a difference for me, but I'm always just kind of curious to know, like, what constitutes as a quote unquote good movie, um, as far as like the critics who are, um, able to submit their reviews on Rotten Tomatoes go. Cause that's the other thing too, is you have to apply to be able to submit your review. Uh huh. On there. I like Shelby's idea for rom coms. I look for low critic ratings, high audience ratings. I could be down with that. 
for a rom-com. Yeah, well, because I can imagine if you're into rom-coms, you're not looking for Shakespeare, right? Right. That's not what you're going to that movie for. And I feel like it's the same thing for a lot of other genres. So I can see where if you're into something that doesn't necessarily tend to land very well with critics most of the time, why you wouldn't care too much about what they have to say about it. Paddington and Paddington 2 were both very, very good movies. I take it you felt the same way, Pam? Yeah, I I love the Paddington movies so much. Um, That's my recommendation for the week. It's just, they're so nice. No, really, and I know I'm not alone. There's like a huge Paddington fan base on on, uh, Twitter specifically. There's just like, there's such a joy to watch. David Heyman, who did, you know, obviously he's the producer for all the Harry Potter movies. This is also produced by Heyday Productions. So you kind of already knew it was going to be pretty good because he was um, behind it and stuff like that. But they're just such a joy. So if you're looking for something really wholesome to watch, um, I would watch those if you haven't yet because they're lovely. Well, we have an update on Lady Gaga's dog situation. You'll remember a couple of months ago, we talked about how Lady Gaga's dogs were dog napped. Um, and her dog Walker was shot in said dog napping. Um, it was a really, really critical injuries. He was shot like four times. Um, well, five arrests have been made in connection to this uh, incident. Three of the suspects um, were arrested on charges of attempted mur- attempted murder. Um, so this would have to do with the shooting of the dog walker. The other two were charged with accessory to attempted murder. This is from uh, a CNN article reporting on this. Detectives do not believe the suspects were targeting the victim because of the dog's owner. However, evidence suggests the suspects knew the great value of the breed of dogs, and that was the motivation for the robbery. And drum roll, please. One of the suspects is... The woman who reportedly found the dogs, the one who found them tied up in a back alley and brought them into a police station, and detectives have also connected her to the father of one of the attempted murder suspects. Face palm. <laughs> of course. <laughs> what an idiot. <laughs> well, I was so sure that these people knew they were dog napping Lady Gaga's dogs, and I was wrong. Laura, you you called it. You should be working for the LAPD because (laughs) you have a good sense of these things as somebody who consumes all forms of true crime stories. Well, that could be it. I didn't even think about it that way. (laughs) I wasn't I wasn't even thinking about it from a perspective of like, ooh, Andrew was wrong. I was more thinking about it from a perspective of what fucking idiot is involved in a crime like this and then tries to act like she found the dogs. Yeah, that's why would you like? Why would you put yourself anywhere near this? Because the if money you knew called. You were involved. The money called. Ugh. Gaga was putting I, up how much money for info? I thought it was like half a mil. Ha, yeah. Like I hope that she either didn't pay that money or that she's going to be able to get her get her money back. I'm not generally too invested in the lives of celebrities, but this was something that hit really close to home for me because I'm a dog mom. Mm -hmm. And if somebody kidnapped my dog, I would be like Liam Neeson and Taken. (laughs) Be like, I'm going to find you and I'm going to kill you. (laughs) Um so I this this story just like it hit home for me because, you know, we all love our pets, our fur babies. So Yeah. So shocking. Yeah, glad that it's had a happy ending and glad that some people are being brought to justice. Definitely. All right, we've got some recommendations coming momentarily, but first I want to take a quick moment to tell you about one of our show's sponsors. They're Third Love, and they make the best bras on the market. I've been wearing Third Love's bras for a couple of years at this point, and I am never going back. With their signature memory foam cups, no slip straps, and scratch-free band, these are the most comfortable and supportive bras I've ever owned. Third Love provides a much better bra shopping experience with their fitting room quiz. This is like having a personal shopper for your boobs because it focuses on breast shape, current fit issues, and your personal style to deliver bras and underwear that are perfect for you. It's time to break up with your bad bra and fall in love with better bras and underwear. You deserve it. 
Third Love knows your one true fit is out there. So right now they're offering our listeners 20% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash millennial to find your perfect fitting bra and get 20% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash millennial for 20% off today. It's time for recommendations. So back in the day on Nintendo 64, there was a game called Pokemon Snap. And you drive around in a vehicle taking pictures of Pokemon out in the wild. And it was a really cute game. I loved it. A lot of people loved it. There was a machine at Blockbuster where you could take your Pokemon Snap cartridge and go print out your Pokemon Snap photos. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. New Pokemon Snap is now available for Nintendo Switch. It's an entirely new game, as the title implies. It seems like there's a lot more to do in this game. Um, The reviews are very, very good. I've been enjoying it myself. One reason I wanted to recommend this is because a lot of our listeners really loved Animal Crossing because it was a very relaxing game. I find new Pokemon Snap to also be very relaxing. So if you're looking for another game to chill out with, check out new Pokemon Snap. I would like to recommend using fresh fruit in your frozen summer beverages instead of flavored syrups. The reason I bring this up is because over the weekend, we made our own frozen margaritas and they were super delicious and we used all fresh fruits in it in addition to the other margarita ingredients. And honestly, I just thought it tasted a lot better. I'm not a big fan of overwhelming sweetness, which I feel like some of those flavored syrups can do. They're just way too sugary for my taste. And it's also a little bit healthier. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that drinking a frozen alcoholic beverage is good for you, but it's a little bit better if you're using fresh fruit instead of syrup. Laura, what's coming up in After Dark today? We are actually going to be talking about a ban that is coming from the Food and Drug Administration with regards to menthol cigarettes and mass-produced flavored cigars. And we're going to be using that as a jumping off point to talk about our views about sort of like the intersection of governmental oversight and personal accountability. It's going to be a good discussion. Patreon.com slash millennial is where that will be. We really appreciate everybody's support. We have this awesome discord during our live streams. You can watch us record. You can also get ad free millennial. Of course, like Laura just mentioned, after dark access to our planning docs. We have monthly bay hangouts. We have a monthly variety show. We post uh, behind the scenes looks from our own lives. Did you guys see the yearbook photo that I posted on Patreon the other day, by the way? I said I'm going to look. (laughs) <laughs> that sounds really cute. Most likely to be famous, me. <laughs> Look at you go. <laughs> I'm wearing a t-shirt that says MySpace Celebrity on are it. You, I'm giving a thumbs if up. If you like um, Wikipedia, your high school, are you one of those people on the notable alumni? Oh, God, I hope not. <laughs> oh, my God. I would vomit. I did not become famous. I will say, though, I mean... I I do have a podcast, podcasts that are successful. I don't think anybody else has like a podcast or a YouTube channel or was actually actually became famous. So that to uh, most likely to be famous prediction, I guess came true in a way. Now I'm looking up my high school because I want to see if I'm on the notable. <laughs> I actually hold on, wait a second because there is an interesting one from my high school. I just want to remember notable alumni. I'm not on the list. No, Callista Flockhart. Ooh. She went to my high school. Isn't that crazy? I had no idea. That is so cool. Yeah. I like forget that all the time. Do you two have any <laughs> interesting high school alumni? Tupac um, went to tam- my high school for oh, like wow. a few weeks. Yeah. A few weeks. <laughs> yeah. I, I think he didn't like, he wasn't there very long. It might've been a little bit longer than a few weeks, but yeah, he, he went to uh, Taylor Pikes High School, which is where I graduated from. Um, I am looking up my, I don't even see like a notable alumni <laughs> that means nobody so funny. <laughs> came out of your high school, Laura. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I don't see anyone of note here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> my high school has a list of like twenty people. Yeah, a lot of them sports players. That's kind of cool. I really didn't know this. Yeah, I, I don't really care about sports, but yeah, I guess that's cool. Anyway, we got to add me to the list. Simming King Andrew Sims. <laughs> Could put me right below Callista Flockhart. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do if, because remember, our listeners got the simming definition on Urban Dictionary on your behalf. What would you do 
if we managed to get the Wikipedia entry updated to call you the Simming King. What would I do? Simming King and the only person who shit in the high school's hallway. (laughs) What do you mean, what would I do? I guess you want me to poop in public again? I don't know. (laughs) No, I just mean, how would you react if that happened? Oh, I'd love it. Hey, guys, my birthday's in 20 days, so work on that. I just posted a link to the Wikipedia. Was it the Simming definition in Urban Dictionary gift for my birthday, too? I think it was. was. Yeah, anybody can still edit Wikipedia, (laughs) right? They just kind of go through and... yeah. Get on this team. <laughs> Jen, I'm going to put you in charge since you're the only person on, on our stage. <laughs> what am I in charge of? You can have a good time. I didn't want to work. Jen's not even listening. <laughs> 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 Nothing, Jen. Don't worry about it. Somebody else will get it. Also, if you have anything to say about today's episode, you can email millennialshow at gmail.com or use the contact form or anonymous confessional on millennialshow.com. And finally, follow us on social media. We are Millennial Show on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Thank you, everybody, for listening today. I'm Andrew. I'm Laura. And I'm Pamela. Jen, say, and I'm Jen. (laughs) And I'm Jen. Thanks, Jen. (laughs) Thanks, Jen. (laughs) 